Well, welcome. We're going to get started because it's, it's 11 o'clock and uh, we have a pretty tight schedule and a lot to accomplish. I was um, actually trying to get up uh, Izzy's last presentation. If For those of you that were in the ballroom just a minute ago, she had a really nice summary of today's track um, goals for this particular, for the multi-benefits track, but I will um, reiterate it for her. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Liz Mansfield. And um, we are in the multiple benefits reclamation track, mine reclamation track. Um, I'm very excited to be facilitating this group. I personally think this is the best track, just so to let you know that you're in the best room by far, most interesting. We've got a fantastic panel, and it's one of my favorite topics, which is multiple benefits. And I, I think Izzy may have asked me to, to facilitate this because um, today I really am a huge advocate and proponent of anything with multiple benefits. Um, I think the state and federal government has made it pretty clear that we don't really want to spend a lot of money in projects or programs that don't accomplish more than one goal. Um, so we are, we are tied to that. Um, fortunately, it's not hard to do. Um, uh, just a little creativity, a little, little you know, um, understanding of the issue, and you can look at ways in which we can provide multiple benefits. Today, and this conference in particular, um, the Sierra Fund in, is really, really trying to explore the options of multiple benefits in terms of mine reclamation. What we would like to do today is to explore with these wonderful speakers the removal of sedimentation and, and ways in which we can do that and the potential benefits um, of removing that sedimentation. We will discuss aspects of water quality improvements, water supply, water storage improvements, fisheries and habitat, both upstream in the reservoir and downstream. We don't have a fisheries expert on the panel, however, I think these gentlemen can touch on it um, a little bit in terms of what we know might be a possibility. We're also looking at um, you know, reservoir expansion, flood management, um, and then ultimately looking at the, the, the product, potential product of mercury and gold, gold in particular. This afternoon, our next track will sort of narrow it down and start really looking at gold as a potential product that will provide um, funding to, to provide more mine, re mine reclamation. And that is uh, an incredibly interesting strategy that we're looking for um, understanding by our panel experts and by the audience so that we can really flush out this potential strategy. You know, is this really a viable option? Can we remove sedimentation, provide multiple benefits, get a product out of this, and then use that money to put back into either further mine reclamation, restoration, or other potential cultural or, or tribal benefits? Um, so that, that's sort of the, the, the nutshell, what we're gonna be accomplishing in this track today. So starting with the bigger picture, narrowing it down to gold with experts and narrowing it down even further. Um, so that's, it's, that's really exciting, at least it is for me. Um, the way I'm gonna facilitate this today is I will, we will have these speakers give their presentation. I, I will allow a few minutes right after their presentation for some really burning questions, which I do encourage. I think it's important that if you have a question to go ahead and answer, ask the question right after the presentation. And then after all three panelists, we'll open up to for conversation and discussion with the entire audience. Okay. Well, with that, I don't want to take their presentation time away from them. Um, our first speaker is um, Rem Schertzinger. He's the general manager of Nevada Irrigation. De I, I got to tell him this, so I couldn't pronounce his name. So he says Schertzinger. And then just sort of stuck, so now, now it's kind of funny. Um, so he has served as general manager at the Nevada Irrigation District since January 2013. He brings extensive knowledge and experience in the water utility field. He is a former utility engineering, engineering manager with the city of Petaluma and has also worked with Sonoma County Water Agency and Metropolitan Water District. He holds an MBA degree and a is a licensed civil engineer. Welcome, Rem, and uh, we look forward to hearing uh, more about your project. The speaker will be up at the podium, and I will have this for questions afterwards. 
All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think I know like half the people in the room. Um, but I'm happy to come and talk to you about our project. We're really excited about this, and it's actually running today. It was running yesterday. I guess some people went out to visit it. Um, we're super pleased. So, come on, let's go. There we go. Okay, so over the next few minutes, we'll talk about briefly uh, about where NID is, for those of you who don't know where we are. Uh, we'll talk about how NID sees this issue. Uh, we'll briefly discuss uh, the Comey project and then the Rollins project as well and, and in total, and then we'll take some questions. So, uh, wow, that went fast. All right, so Grass Valley is, uh, here's where we are. Grass Valley is right there. There it is. And the two projects that we'll talk about are here and there. It, it might be easier for me to use the microphone. Is it on? There we go. Thank you. So with that, we will begin. So how does NID see this? this what is a, what's our driving issue here? Uh, the issue for us is, is about reservoir reclamation, but our goal is to find an effective way to deal with mercury contaminants and sediment. This isn't to us, this isn't a water quality issue in that we're delivering water to our customers. We can get the mercury out through the treatment process, and, and we know that it's not in the raw water as long as sediment's not active there. But the goal of the project in its, in its very simple form is how do we work with the mercury-laden sediments in our reservoirs or around our reservoirs as we're trying to do the work that we do. Now, you may think, well, is it... How, how big an issue is this? And I can, I can tell you that when I first was exposed to this, it is absolutely ubiquitous. Uh, Tim Crow, our AGM, went out and he grabbed a block of, of clay that was there at Combi, cracked it in half, and you could see sparkle through it, like, like, it, like little kid's fairy powder. It, it, it was that full of mercury. So it, it, this is an issue for us at a major level. So NID's goal in this process is to develop a transparent and transferable methodology for all of our sister agencies that are working in this environment. We want to be able to develop a rubric for both wet, semi-wet, and dry environments so that we can say, NID's done it, here's how you do it, and hand this package to whoever's next, be it Georgetown, which is a little tiny district, all the way down to Sac San Diego, uh, water Authority. They're having issues just like us. So it, it goes everywhere. So what have we been up to? So here's the Combi project. So the Combi project that everybody's heard about, the, the Mercury machine, I can say, and I'm very proud of the fact that NID owns the only Mercury machine in the world. It is a singular device. We have designed it with, with Pegasus Engineering, and we have it. Um, it, it came to us at, at significant cost, but I'm also happy to say that we use some of our gold bars. Sorry, board members. Uh, we, we had some, um, and we, we mailed them <laughs> to Canada. Um, anyway, so uh, the, the machine is right there. You can't really see it, the, the centrifuge. We'll look at that in a second. And inside this is, is the mercury. But here's the issue. So the Combi Reservoir is a little reservoir. It's uh, our quad nickel, 5,555 acre feet. It's a small stilling reservoir, but we use it to modulate our lower division. So roughly 54% of all the water that we deliver through to agriculture flows through this reservoir and we balance it on this reservoir. So it's, it's a big deal. The material that we're gonna remove is roughly 125,000 cubic yards of material and it's really, really fine. It's, it's mostly mud because the larger sediments are being caught in the upper reservoir, Rollins. But what does that mean? It means 25 million gallons of water, or roughly 200 and, how many, 252 homes worth of water for an entire year. That's a real tangible benefit. That's, that's, that's real, those are, those are people, and we can put their water back in this reservoir. And that's why that's important to us. So, here's Combi. So this is uh, Tykert's site right here, and this is uh, a sediment pond that was in operation while the quarry was working. And down here is the area that we're going to operate. So here's a close-up of it. And you can see the sediment plume is building. And we can show through time lapse that it's moving further and further into the reservoir. Again, a small reservoir. That water that goes into that reservoir is turned over once every two days. So it, 
we're, we're moving this, this, this system a lot. So we have to get that out. So here's a picture of the machine. So on the machine itself is, uh, this is the shaker, but then we have a shaker box here, we have a magnetic wheel, and we have the actual centrifuge here. Uh, for those of you that did see it, this is the wizard wheel right here. And so you can see when they pull the material out of the, out of the hopper on the, cent on the centrifuge, you can, and you have the centrate, you can, they pour it on there. And all, all, the, all the guys that work for me are dying to get that job because they want to see the little gold beads and the little mercury beads running up and dropping in the hole. Um, so, but that's it in a nutshell. Uh, $700,000 worth of equipment. Uh, we're, we're really pleased it works. We're, we're removing 99% plus out of the, uh, in terms of mercury uh, elemental in there. And it's coming with a little bit of gold. This is the E3 gold that Izzy talked about. Um, and our, this is last year, because so we're dealing with this sediment issue now, is how do we bring some of the larger sediment out and instead of sticking it in the tank, now we have a little conveyor system that's, that's carrying it and dumping it into a hopper that we can take away. So uh, in 2004, we, we actually perfected constant state operations, so, uh, or steady state operations. So for the first time, we've been able to run the machine for a prolonged period of time and demonstrate that we can. It isn't just a batch run, a batch run, a batch run, which is what we had done previous. Uh, crew training, we've had some turnover. We had a number of retirements happen over the last couple of years. So getting our guys trained up on the equipment and making sure that we can do it safely because this is a, this is a very different industrial process from our job of, of treating water and the guys on the plant. This is now, uh, this is mining at a, at, at a level that we don't normally do. In 2015, uh, one of our big issues was our ability to put uh, the the effluent water from the machine, which is very turbid, back into the lake. So we've been working with a number of coagulant distributors to come up with a coagulant profile and rain for rent to, put, uh, to build a set of weir tanks so that we can put water at almost drinking water quality levels back into the reservoir, which is a huge step for us because it means that now we know how to take it out, we know how to process it, we know how to process the water and we can put the water back when we're done. So sediment management, we're also trying to figure out how do we pile it, where do we pile it, um, what do we do with it while we have it, is it clean, is it not clean, that kind of stuff. So we're working with Tykert, uh, who's at the site, because it has a beautiful batch of sand, it has a beautiful batch of clean cobble, it's, it's really quite awesome. And then, now that we have our water quality, well, we're, I think we're on our way to having our water quality permit. As soon as we have that in hand, we're gonna go get our dredge and we're gonna start actively dredging. So we will be able to go from bottom of the reservoir into the machine and out of the machine in one shot, which will be the first time that anybody has done this level of work to remove this contaminant from any reservoir. This is also informing the statewide mercury project or program that's coming out of the State Water Resources Control Board. And so it's been really important for us to be in that environment because there are a number of entities all the way down the coast that are trying to address this. Not only the coastal groups that are at Berryessa and Clear Lake that have mercury problems, but also down in San Diego where they have mercury problems. And they're talking about saying, well, they were on the track of injecting oxygen or nitrate to try to sequester mercury. And because we're in the room, we can say, no, no, you don't want to sequester it, you want to remove it. And this is how you do it. So here we go. All right, so where we stand now, so we've developed the machine that can remove mercury from any system. We believe that this technology is scalable. So as I was mentioning earlier, um, whether we go down in size to get to the recreational dredgers, so in a weird way, the recreational dredgers would start removing mercury from the system as a quid pro quo for their doing their own mining operations, which in turn would help the environment just in a nutshell. So it would be a byproduct of a process that they're trying to, to achieve. But we also know that we can take this technology and make it bigger. And once we can make it bigger, then we can go after much larger reservoirs, like the reservoir that I'll talk about next. So uh, can we, we can return water quality, so we can put water back into the system that has zero detect for mercury. Not a little bit of detect, not below the measurable standard, zero. So, and then our turbidity levels are below background so that we can put the water back. In fact, I would, I would venture to say uh, Regional Water Quality Board will be more upset that we're putting clean water back in the system than the water that's there. 
Um, so the end of the year, we should have full-scale operations, and we're excited to begin to develop uh, a quarry-based and reservoir-based system. What I mean by that is not only are we talking about removing material in the wet, but if we're removing it in the dry, we can move equipment like this and take that dry material, process it through our equipment, and again, provide clean uh, aggregate. So this is the Rollins project. This is where we're headed. This is what we're trying to get to. So this reservoir is one of our largest at uh, full on almost 66,000 acre feet. It is our workhorse on the Bear River side. Um, currently, on the, there's, two, there's two arms to, oh, I didn't put this one. So this is one arm, this is the Greenhorn arm. The other one is the Steep Hollow arm. They both Y into one. Um, the Greenhorn arm is a, is an, was a real opportunity for us because Hanson Aggregates already has a mining permit there and we thought we could try some of the dry work that we were proposing. So on this one, uh, if we take a cut 40 feet deep in terms of the Greenhorn side, we believe that we have about 2 million, yeah, 2.7 million cubic yards of material, roughly 546 million gallons or 4750 homes. That's, that's like all of Lake Wildwood for anybody that knows. I mean, so essentially we would put their storage back in the reservoir. This sediment lens here has happened since the 90s. Before the 90s, you could drive your speedboat all the way up the Greenhorn side and park it right there. And they had apparently had crazy bonfires up here because I have the emails about the homeowners here not liking it. <laughs> so, uh, we have, uh, so in 2013, Tim and I thought, well, we have this really low water condition at the end of the year. The sediment is dry. It's sandy. Why not get in there and try to move it around and see if we can move a bunch of it? So we went in, uh, we, had our, we had the mining permit, we had our plans, we got everything we needed to have, and we went in and in roughly seven days, we were able to lay down enough equipment and we moved 13,000 yards. That little pile of dirt, just for a, uh, for a sense of scale, there's a little hole right here on, this is a LIDAR map that was run this year. There's a little hole right there and the pile of dirt is right there. It's nothing. Uh, but we showed that we can do it. We physically know how to do it. We ran into a frog issue. There were yellow-legged frogs. We stopped, we mitigated, and we tried again. So in 2014, we did some sample studies because we found, again, this is the beauty of what we're trying to accomplish. We found that we were creating methyl, methyl mercury from the ditch from where the creek was. It was migrating the water where we made a cutoff ditch, a dewatering ditch. Water was moving through the soil matrix and it was collecting in this cutoff ditch and we had this crazy bloom of red algae. So the Sierra Fund, uh, Carrie, is Carrie in the room? Nope. So Carrie and Tim worked and they ran a series of samples and we checked it out and yeah, there's some methylation there. So it's gonna change how we do business. What we know now is we have to lay a pipe, bury it, make it anoxic, and now we can move that water and capture it elsewhere. So in, 20, in 2015, we fully anticipate doing some semi-wet, but if the drought continues, I may have a dry condition again. And uh, we're gonna try a sheet pile wall storage activity and maybe try to do some stuff up towards the mine or up towards the, the bridge. <coughs> oh, so there's the little pile. All right, so why is this an issue for us? This is, so we're looking at, uh, so as I mentioned, there's two arms. This is the green horns arm and this is the steep hollow arm. All of this white, is sediment. That's all coming for our reservoir. That's coming to take capacity from us. And in the past, it kind of, Hansen was able to hold it way back up here. They're unable to hold it anymore. And some of that is, we gotta figure that part out. So here's a close up. So why is all this sediment coming? And this is to Izzy's point. That's a mine, that's a mine, that's a mine, that's a mine. This is a crazy mine. There shouldn't be water that color in the Sierras. That's more for the Caribbean. <laughs> these are mines. So you can see these tributaries are pouring sediment into our lake. And every major storm event, more and more of that material is coming towards us. So more and more of that mercury, more and more of that stuff is headed towards the reservoir. So we need to figure out how to deal with it. So here again, you can see this is a much finer type of sediment as opposed to the stuff that was larger, it had a whiter tint to it. So there's more sands in this. 
um, but it's slowly but surely right here, it's now crossing into the reservoir proper. So this is the project area that we're trying to work in. Uh, one of the things that we have run into is when, when you remove 2.7 million cubic yards of material, where do you put it? I don't know where to put it. I can't, I can't I, we're thinking actually about going back to some of these mine sites and using those as, as, as a place to stockpile. But we have to process that material through the machine and then go back up and put that material somewhere safe. So, the, so Rollins Lake on the Greenhorn side, we're, in, we've, we're doing the permit modifications now. We're developing the off-haul plan. We're coming up with a second, uh, our second little pilot scale, maybe move some dirt around idea. Uh, maybe wet, semi-wet, maybe dry. In 2016, we, begin, we, we plan on beginning in situ projects for sediment reduction. Uh, we want to develop a sediment trap and develop an off-haul plan. We have to figure out how to get it out of there. That's really a, a major problem for us. Uh, on the steep hollow side, we're finishing our CEQA. We're about to start our access rights, so we, we need access to a road. And we anticipate probably in 2016 that we'll develop some partnership contracts in terms of starting to mine that side as well. So we're excited about that. So just some quick project partners. We couldn't do any of this by ourselves. NID definitely does is not a, not a one entity show. You know, without the Sierra Fund and, and Izzy and her crew, you know, we would be, I don't think we would be where we are, absolutely and without a question. Uh, CABI, we've been super successful uh, with DWR in getting money to operate the machine and develop this technology so that our ratepayers aren't the only ones bearing this cost. Uh, Tykert, uh, they've helped us by providing the site and support at the site, and USGS, we've, you know, we continue to run samples and they're the most credible science we have going. On the other side of the fence, so in Rollins, you know, the Sierra Fund again um, has helped us a lot with our, you know, hey, let's try to move some dirt idea, uh, and Hanson Brothers who had the permit, and then definitely support from USGS and Fish and Wildlife and the, and the Water Board. Uh, this has been a great opportunity for us and we continue to move forward on this and we will not slow down until we find a solution because our, our customers and our reservoirs are in danger and this is the only way that we know of to fix it at this point. And the beauty of it is everything that comes out of this process is clean and ready for another use. So as a, as a child of the late 60s and early 70s, reuse, reuse, recycle was pounded into my head. That and ironized paddling through the Ohio River um, I have aggregate that's clean. I have gold that was harvested without damaging the environment. I have rare earth element that's coming out. So cell phones can have some level of recycled product locally harvested. Mercury is removed. It may find a home in mercury switches. It may be sequestered somewhere else. We'll, we'll find a home for it, but it's out of our system. It's out of our environment and it meets the triple bottom line, environmental, econ economic, and society. So with that, any questions? Um, I'll, no fair. Okay, sure. Okay. I'll leave this up here. Okay. I'm, I'm Janet Cohen from Community Action Partners, and I've wrote the grant to get them some of this money. Um, but I'm wondering whether you, are you making any money out of all this clean aggregate and so forth? Are you able to sell anything? Have you tried yet? Not yet. So we're, we're just at the beginning of that, Janet. So I think at some point, we'll be able to develop some kind of economy of scale. But right now, we can't, until we're at full-scale operations, we don't know how much material will be coming out of it, how much, you know, how much can Tykert use, how much do we crush, how much do we turn into concrete. Um, the gold stuff clearly will have a home. Mercury will have a home. Uh, the rare earth element thing, that's one of our trying to figure that one out. Apparently, there might be some interest at Apple, but yeah, it would be a fantastic partnership. Sir. Oh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Chris Wright, supervisor from Calaveras County, a little south of us. Um, I have a couple questions. Following up on the uh, gold question, how much gold ha have you gotten out of this? Uh, so we have a couple small flex currently, but until we retort off the mercury. So uh, this is kind of the crazy part. So we processed 15 yards, 15 cubic yards of material earlier this year. We extracted three grams of mercury. That's a lot. I mean, that's the size of a nickel. So, um, but inside that, we know that there's gold because it's not fully round, it's elongated. So we'll retort it off and slowly but surely we'll get to it. And then, um, so how much can you treat per day right now? Uh, that's our question. So right now, I know that we can on the, we were able to do 15 yards in roughly an hour. 
I think once we get to a more prolonged pace with a, with a dredge feeding the system as opposed to a guy in a backhoe, we'll be able to do much more. So the machine was $750,000? Yes. Um, and so how long do you expect that machine to last? Uh, what kind of you know, uh, repairs? Uh? Not very long. This is really, Chris, this is pilot scale. We're aware of another centrifuge in Nevada that we could modify again. Um, so it's either, uh, the question that we have right now is do we, do we scale it up? Do we make the unit larger? Or do we make a series of, of similar sized units? Because one of the things that we find is that we run the machine and then you have to go in, pull the centrate hopper, clean it out, put it back in. It may be better for us to have four units all running in series, one offline, three processing, so that you never lose, you never lose the run. But that's the whole point of this process, is to try to figure this all out. And then finally, and maybe this is uh, not a question at this point, but uh, when you showed the map of all the sediment and uh, you know, directly linked to the mining, uh, aren't the mines uh, responsible for that sediment? Uh, if you could find the owner, absolutely. Um, but. They've been dead for quite some time, I think. Yeah. But who owns the mineral rights? Uh, to which part? To the gold. Uh, NID does, once it's on our land. Uh, one last one. Okay. I, I'm not sure what your definition of sediment is, but the wet stuff, if it's sort of like mud, muck, doesn't dredging stir it up more? Have you ever thought of kind of sucking it out? So the, the unit that we're, we're proposing to use is called Nessie. It's an electric, uh, it looks like a little vacuum cleaner that runs along the bottom with a hose. So it's always negatively pressured. So all of that stuff goes in. This is uh, not the standard old Army Corps dredging, you know, drop the clamshell in, grab a chunk of muck, stick it on the barge. We're not, we won't be anywhere near that, partly because we couldn't, uh, we couldn't meet the water quality requirements. Uh, we would, the month sediment gets up into the, into the water column, it trips the, the mercury water quality issue and that shuts us down. Okay, thank you, Rem. Thank you. Oh, Gary. All right, all right. You were dry land, your dry material. Yeah. Is that a dry process or will that be an aqueous process? It will be dry. So we'll drive scrapers in, pick up the material, take it somewhere else. And that's why the machine being mobile is so important to us because then when you set it down, you're gonna put it through the Grizzly and shake out what, whatever it is, right? And you can wash that material, put it through the hopper, take the mercury out of it, and process it. So the dry actually might be more efficient in terms of gallons of water needed for the kind of process. Oh, absolutely. We, th we think that the, the dry operations is a, it's a land moving process and the mercury doesn't go anywhere. What we're finding with the stuff we did earlier this year is that in the semi-wet, it's moving around, and so we need to figure out how to control that. Okay, thank you very thank you. much, Rem. So, um, so Ram did a beautiful job of explaining to us and giving a presentation on the fact that the technology does exist, and it is scalable. So, um, and, and he clearly articulated the, the benefits of clean water, clean sand, clean gravel, and this idea of the harvesting of gold, mercury, and maybe other minerals. 